Yes, yes, mother, I'll get a taxi right away. I'm sorry. Ah, that's your son, is he? Well, if you've done your duty, farmers and mother, should you wouldn't let him spoil a poor girl's flowers and run away without paying? Go about your business, my girl. And you wouldn't run off without paying neither. There's the man who's for you. Taxi, taxi, please. Cheer up, Captain. Fast flower of the poor girl. I'm sorry, I don't have any change. Go on, I can charge you half a crown. Here, take this for tuppence. No, I really don't have any. Stop. Oh, here's three headpins if it's any use to you. Thank you, Captain. There! You be careful. Better give him a flower for it. There's a copper there behind that pillar, typing down every blessed word you're saying. Oh, oh but I ain't done nothing wrong by speaking in a gentle way. Now, what respectable girl so help me? I've never spoke to him except to ask him to buy a flower. What's up, girl? What's it, girl? There's a copper taking it down. What it means to me, they'll take away my character and drop me on the streets for speaking a jingle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who's hurting you, silly girl? What do you take me for? Oh, my bottle of I never said it's a word. Do I look like a policeman? What do you take down my words for? How do I know whether you took me down right? You just show me what you wrote about me. Did you go to school? What you try to be for a fool? No one told 
talking to you instead of trying. Here a Yorkshireman, or worse, here a Cornishman converse. I'd rather hear a choir singing flat. Chickens cackling in a barn, just like this one. Gar. Gar. <laughs> I ask you, sir, what sort of word is that? <laughs> it's ow and gar that keep her in her place. Not her wretched clothes and dirty face. Why can't the English teach their children how to speak? This verbal class distinction by now should be antique. If you spoke as she does, sir, instead of the way you do, why, you might be selling flowers to I beg your pardon. An Englishman's way of speaking absolutely classifies him. The moment he talks, he makes some other Englishman despise him. One common language I'm afraid you'll never get. But why can't the English learn? What well, set a good example to people whose English is painful to your ears? The Scots and the Irish leave you close to tears. There are even are places where English completely disappears. In America, they haven't used it for years. <laughs> Why can't the English teach their children how to speak? Norwegians learn Norwegian. The Greeks are taught their Greek. In France, every Frenchman knows his language. <laughs> Arabians learn Arabian with the speed of summer lightning. The Hebrews learn it backwards, which is absolutely frightening. If you use proper English, you're regarded as a freak. Oh, why can't the English? Why can't the English learn?
Eliza, what a surprise! Not a brass farthing. Eliza, I ain't gonna type me order and wages and let you pass them on to a bloody pub keeper. Come on, Eliza, you wouldn't have the art to send me over to your stepmother without a bit of liquid protection. <laughs> stepmother. <laughs> To marry her. It's me that suffers for it. I'm a slave to that woman, Eliza. Come on, Eliza. Slip your old dad off a crown to go on. No. I had a bit of luck myself tonight. So we yeah. But don't keep coming round, coming off crowns from me. Thank you, Eliza. You're a noble daughter! <laughs> you see, I told you not to go out. No, boy, boy. All it takes is faith, hope, and a little bit of luck. The Lord above gave man an arm of iron, so he could do his job and never shirk. The Lord above gave man an arm of iron, but with a little bit of luck, with a little bit of luck, shall I have to do the thing? Tight me unless I can talk more 
genteel. Well, he said he could teach me. Well, here I am, ready to pay. You're not asking any favour, and he treats me as if I was dirt. Well, I know what lessons cost as well as you do, and I'm ready to pay. How much? Ah, now you're talking. I thought you'd come off it when you saw a chance of getting back a bit of what you chucked at me last night. You did a drop in, and you? Sit down. <laughs> Sit down! Sit down, girl. Do as you're told. What is your name? Liza. <coughs> Doolittle. Won't you sit down, Miss Doolittle? You eat the other. 
If you want to talk of Keats or Milton, she only wants to talk of love. You get to see a play or ballet and spend it searching for her glove. Oh, let a woman in your life can you invite eternal strife? Let them buy their wedding bands for those anxious little hands. I'd be equally as willing for a dentist to be drilling than to ever let a woman in my life. I'm a very gentle man. <laughs> Even tempered and good natured, whom you never hear complain, who has the milk of human kindness by the court in every vein. A patient man am I, down to my fingertips. The sword never could, ever would, let an insulting remark escape his lips. Just a very gentle man. But let a woman in your life, and you are plunging in a knife. Let the others of my sex tie the knot around their necks. I prefer a new edition of the Spanish Inquisition than to ever let a woman in my life. I'm a quiet living man <laughs> who prefers to spend his evenings in the silence of his room, who likes an atmosphere as restful as an undiscovered tomb, a pensive anima of philosophic joy. Likes to meditate, contemplate, free from humanity's mad, inhuman norms. Just a quiet living man. But let a woman in your life, then your sabbatical is through. In a line that never ends, come an army of her friends, come to jabber and to chatter and to tell her what the matter is with you.
but will you take advantage of a man's nature to do him out the price of his own daughter? What he's brought up, fed and clothed, for the sweat of his own brow, till she's grown big enough to be interested to you, too, gentlemen. Is five pounds unreasonable? I put it to you, and I'll leave it to you. You know, Beggary, if we were to take this man in hand for the next six months, he could choose between a seat in the cabinet and a popular pulpit in Wales. <laughs> oh, no, 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 thank you, kindly, Governor. No, undeserving poverty is my right. He's not given a fiver. He made bad use of it, I'm afraid. So, under Governor, all right, there won't be a penny of it left, my mother. <laughs> just, just, just one good spree for myself and the missus. Giving pleasure to ourselves and employment to others. You couldn't spend it better. This is irresistible. Let's give him ten. No, no! Oh, the missus would have the art to spend ten, sir. Ten pounds is a lot of money. No, no, it makes a man feel prudent, like, and then good by the happiness. No, you give me what I ask for. Not a penny less, not a penny more. I would rather draw the line at encouraging this sort of immorality. Now, do it. Why don't you marry this missus of yours? After all, marriage is not so frightening. You married Eliza's mother. Who told you that? Pickering, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if we listen to this man for another minute, we shall have no convictions left. <laughs> Five pounds, I think. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Thank you. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. He's bloody bad. Ah, <laughs> Don't she, Governor? <laughs> yeah. What are you doing here? You hold your time. Don't you give these gentlemen none of your lip, Governor. If you have any trouble with her, you give her a few minutes and a scrap. That's the way to improve her mind. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. Cheerio, Martha. <laughs> By George, there's a man for you. The philosophical genius of the first water. Mrs. Pierce. Write to Mr. Ezra D. Wallingford and tell him if he wants a lecturer to get in touch with Mr. Alfred P. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Common dustman, but one of the most original moralists in England. Yes, sir. Here, what did he come for? <clears throat> say your vows. I know the vows. I know them before I come. If you know them, say them. I, A, I, am ye. Stop. Say A. I owe you. That's what I said. I owe you. I've been saying them for three days. I won't say them no more. I know it's difficult, Miss Thunigle, but try to understand. No use explaining, Pickering. As a military man, you should know that. Drilling is what she needs. You're much better to leave her, or she'll be turning to you for sympathy. All right, if you insist, but have a little patience with her head in. Of course. <laughs> say A. Oh, no, you want A. 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 A.
I won't go to waste. I know someone who's immensely fond of strawberry tarts. Officer!
was that? I'm 
he had to come, he says, he means, you see, he's taking the girl to the annual embassy ball, and he wanted to try her out first. I beg your pardon. <laughs> no, the annual embassy ball. No, the annual embassy ball. <laughs> what a girl. Oh, well, it's quite classical, really. You see, one night I went to the opera at Covent Garden to hear one of my favorite operas, Aida, and as I was coming out, Incidentally, they didn't do Aida that night. No, they did Goethe Demerung instead. <laughs> I've never heard Goethe Demerung before. By George, that's a rackety. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what am I to do? Ah, yes, look, as I was coming out, I met your son, Henry, who in turn met Miss Doolittle, who now lives with Henry. <laughs> lives with him? <laughs> Is it a love affair? Heavens, no. She's a flower girl. He picked her up off the curbstone. <laughs> oh, flower girl. He is a pickle, and you see this girl? In six months, I could make a taxi of her. Charles, you better stay by the car. I may well be leaving abruptly. <laughs> Health. 
Never long, darling, and you'll be quite safe. Safe? To talk about our health and asthma? But you have to talk about something. And you're not even dressed properly. I changed my shirt. Where's the girl now? Being pinned. Some of the clothes we bought for didn't quite fit. I told Pickering we should have taken her with us. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mrs. Ainsford Hill. Oh, damn, all these people with you. Mrs. Higgins, is this your celebrated son? Well, I'm afraid my celebrated son has no manners. The devil could they be? Oh, Colonel Pickering, just in time for tea. Ah, uh, Mrs. Higgins, thank you. May I introduce Miss Eliza Doolittle? My dear Miss Doolittle, how kind of you to let me come. <laughs> I'm delighted. <laughs> Lord and Lady Boxington, Miss Eliza Doolittle. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? And Mrs. and Miss Hinesford Hill, Miss Eliza Doolittle. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? How do Not 
her. <laughs> she was mother's milk. <laughs> Stop. 
Mrs. Higgins. Well, she got past the first hurdle. The ambassador's wife was completely captivated. I heard several people at the reception asking who she was. Mrs. Higgins, do you think Eliza will make it? Why do you hope so? I have grown enormously fond of the girl. Professor Henry Higgins. Maestro! Maestro, you remember me! Oh, oh. <laughs> I am your pupil, your first best and greatest pupil. I am Sultan, Karpati, that marvelous boy. You teach me phonetics. I have made your name famous throughout Europe. You cannot forget me. <laughs> Where did you find all these old coins? <laughs> Decorations for language. <laughs> the Queen of Transylvania is here this evening. I am indispensable to her at these international parties. I speak 32 languages. I know everybody in Europe. No imposter escaped my detention. And now, Professor, you must introduce me to this glorious creature you escort this evening. She fascinates everyone. His Excellency D. Pomostocles the Bollers. This so-called Greek diplomat. Pretends he cannot speak English, but he does not deceive me. He is a son of a Yorkshire watch, my girl. He speaks English so brilliantly he dare not utter a word of it without betraying his origin. I can't keep to pretend, but I make a pay for the nurse. I make them all die. Excuse me, sir. You are going to the stairs. Her Excellency has asked for Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Higgins, don't let's risk it. Let's collect her and leave immediately. Miss Eliza Doolittle.
it's all over. Oh. Now I can go to bed at last without dreading tomorrow. Good night, Mr. Higgins. Good night. I think I shall turn in two. It's been a great occasion, a triumph for you. Good night. Good night, Pitman. Oh, Mrs. Pierce! Damn. I meant to tell her I wanted coffee in the morning instead of tea. Eight little notes for her, Eliza. The devil have I done with my slippers? There are your slippers in there. Take your slippers and may you never have a day's luck with them. What's the matter? Is anything wrong? <laughs> no, nothing wrong with you. I won your bet for you, haven't I? That's enough for you. I don't matter, I suppose. You won my bet. You, presumptuous insect, I won it. What did you throw those slippers at me for? Because they wanted to smash your face. I'd like to kill you, you selfish brute. Why didn't you leave me where you picked me out of in the gutter? Now you thank God it's all over. You can throw me back again there, do you? So the creature is nervous after all. No, <laughs> no, Show your temper to me. Sit down and be quiet. What is to become of me? What is to become of me? Now, how the devil do I know what's to become of you? What does it matter what becomes of you? You don't care. I know you don't care. You wouldn't care if I was dead. I'm nothing to you. Not so much as them slippers. Those slippers! Those slippers! I didn't think it made any difference now. May I ask whether you complain of your treatment here? No. Has anybody behaved badly to you? Have a pickery, Mrs. Pierce? No. You don't pretend that I have treated you badly? No. I'm glad to hear it. Perhaps you're tired after the strain of the day. Here, have a chocolate. No! Thank you. Anyway, it's all over now. There's nothing more to worry about. Nothing more for you to worry about. Oh, God, I wish I was dead. Why? It not say why. Listen to me, Eliza. All this irritation is purely subjective. I don't understand. I'm too ignorant. It's only imagination. Nobody's hurting you. Nothing's wrong. You go to bed and have a little cry and say your prayers. That'll make you comfortable. I heard you. Thank God, it's all over. Well, don't you thank God, it's all over. Now you're free and you can do what you like. What am I fit for? What have you left me fit for? Where am I to go? What am I to do? What is to become of me? Well, that's what's worrying you, is it? Why, well, I, I should imagine you won't have much difficulty in settling yourself somewhere or other. Go ahead. I didn't quite realise you were going away. <coughs> you might marry, you know. You see, Eliza, all men are not confirmed old bachelors like me and the Colonel. Most men are married, so poor devil. And you're not bad looking? It's quite a pleasure to look at you at times. Not now, of course, you've been crying, you look like the very devil, but <laughs> <laughs> when you're all right and quite yourself. What I should call attractive. Come, uh, you go to bed and have a good night's rest, and then get up and look at yourself in the glass, and you won't feel so bad. I dare say my mother could find some chap or other who'd do very well. We were above that in Covent Garden. What do you mean? I sold flowers, I didn't sell myself. Now you've made a lady of me, I'm not fit to sell anything else. Oh, Tosh, Eliza, don't insult human relations by dragging all that cant about buying and selling into it. You needn't marry the fellow if you don't want to. What else am I to do? Oh, lots of things. What about that old idea of a florist shop? Pickering could set you up in one, it's lots of money. <clears throat> You'll be all right. Oh, I really must clear off to bed, I'm devilish sleepy. <laughs> Oh, by the way, I was looking for something. What was it? Your slippers. Oh, yes, of course. You shined them at me. Before you go, sir. Hey. Do my clothes belong to me or to Ken Pickering? 
What the devil use would they be to pickery? If I want them for the next year, we'll pick up to experiment on. Is that the way you feel towards us? I only want to know what belongs to me and what doesn't. My own clothes were burned. But what does it matter? I want to know what I may take away with me. I don't want to be accused of stealing. Stealing? You shouldn't have said that, Eliza. That shows a want of feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only a common, ignorant girl, and in my station I have to be careful. There can't be any feelings between the like of you and the like of me. Now, will you please tell me what belongs to me and what doesn't? You may take the whole damned house full, if you like, except the jewels they're hired. Will that satisfy you? Stop, please. When you take these to a room to keep them safe, I don't want to run the risk of their being missing. Hand them over! These belong to me instead of the jeweler. I ram them down your ungrateful throat. This ring isn't the jeweler's. It's the one you bought me in bride. I don't want it now. <laughs> don't you hit me! Hit you? You could endeavour. How dare you accuse me of such a thing? It is you who have hit me! You have wounded me to the heart! I'm glad. I got a little of my own back anyhow. You have caused me to lose my temper, a thing that has hardly ever happened to me before. <laughs> I prefer to say nothing more tonight. I am going to bed. You'd better leave your own note for Mrs. Pierce about the coffee, for it won't be done by me. Damn Mrs. Pierce, and damn the coffee, and damn you, and damn my own folly in having lavished my hard-earned knowledge and the treasure of my regard and intimacy on a heartless gutter snipe! Oh, 
Oh, <laughs> 
missus on a trip to Brighton. That's for you. Thank you. Let's do a little. All right. Father? Uh-huh. I hope you see that, Harry. He sent her down here to spy on me in my misery, he did. Me own flesh and blood. <laughs> well, I'm miserable. All right, you can tell him that straight. What are you talking about? As if you didn't know. Go, go on back to that compulsory devil. Tell him what he's done to me. What has he done to you? He's ruined me, that's all. Destroyed me up in his, tied me up, and delivered me into the hands of middle class. <laughs> and don't you defend him. Was it him or was it not him that wrote to an old American writer named Wallingford? Who was given five millions to found moral reform societies and tell the most original moralist in England was Mr. Alfred P. Dewey, a common dustman? That sounds like one of his jokes. Uh, you might call it a joke, it put the lid on me right enough. That bloke died and left me four thousand pounds a year in his blooming will. <laughs> <laughs> Who asked him to make a gentleman of me? I, I was at me! <laughs> I was free! A year ago, I had no relation in the world except for one or two who wouldn't speak to me. Now I'm 50. Not a decent speech wages amongst a lot of them. No, I have to live for others now, not for myself. Ah, middle class morality. Come on, Dalvi. In a couple of hours, you have to be at the church. Oh. Church? Yes, church, that's the deepest cut of all. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I'm dressed up like a ruddy pool mirror? Your stepmother wants to marry me. Now I'm respectable, she wants to be respectable. But if that's the way you feel, why don't you give the money back? <laughs> <laughs> That's the tragedy of it. <laughs> it's easy to say, chuck it, but I ought to know. We're all intimidated. <coughs> intimidated. Yeah. So that's what we are. And that's what I am. Bought up. That's what your precious professor brought me to. It's not my precious professor. Oh, oh sent you back, has he? Aha! First, he shoves me in the middle class, then he chucks you out for me to support you. All part of his plan. But you double cross him. Don't you come under me. <laughs> don't, don't you take puppets from me. You stand on your own two feet now. You're a lady now. You can do it. Eliza, shall I get us a taxi? See me turned off this morning, St. George's, Hanover Square, 10 o'clock. I would advise it, but you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks, Dad. Right. Have you finished here? Yes, Freddy. I've finished here. Oh, time. If 
saying a word about it. Well, I'm dashed. What am I to do? I can't find anything. I don't know what appointments I've got. I got tea this morning instead of coffee. Eliza would know. Of course she would, but damn it, she's gone. Did either of you gentlemen frighten her last night? Well, you were there, Mrs. Pierce. We hardly said a word to her. Higgins, <laughs> did you bully her after I went to bed? Just the other way around. She threw the slippers at me. I never gave her the slightest provocation. The slippers came bang in my head before I uttered a word. And she used the most perfectly awful language. I was shocked. Well, I'm deaf. I can't understand it. She was shown every possible consideration. She admitted it herself. Well, I'm deaf. Not say Pickering, stop being dashed and do something. Oh, <laughs> call the police. Mr. Higgins, you can't give Eliza's name to the police as if she were a thief or a lost umbrella. Why not? I want to find her. The girl belongs to me. I paid five pounds for her. Quite right. <laughs> Scotland Yard, please. <laughs> Can I have some coffee, Mrs. Pearson? <laughs> Ah, good morning, old fellow. Colonel Hugh Pickering here, 27A Wimpole Street. I want to report a missing person, Eliza Doolittle. Yes, this is her residence. Between three and four in the morning? No, 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 no relation at all. Let's just say a, a good friend. Hmm? <laughs> what the girl does here is our affair. Your affair is getting her back so she can continue doing it. <laughs> what in all of heaven could have prompted her to go after such a triumph at the ball? What could have depressed her? What could have possessed her? I cannot understand the wretch at all. I say, Higgins, I have an old chum at the home office. Perhaps he can help. Yes, I'll call him. Whitehall 7244, please. Women are irrational, that's all there is to that. Their heads are full of cotton hay and rags. <laughs> They're nothing but exasperating, irritating, vacillating, calculating, agitating, maddening, and infuriating hands. <laughs> oh, hello, is Brewster Budge in there, please? Oh, could you ask him to call that thing? Diggering, why can't a woman be more like a man? <laughs> yes, why can't a woman be more like a man? Never so honest, so thoroughly square, eternally noble, historically fair. When you win, you'll we'll always give your back a pat. Why can't a woman be like that? <laughs> Why does everyone do what the others do? Can't a woman learn to use her head? Why do they do everything their mothers do? Why don't they grow up like their fathers instead? Why can't a woman just take after a man? Isn't men are so pleasant, so easy to please. Whenever you're with them, you're always at ease. Would you be slighted if I didn't speak for hours? Of course not. Would you be livid if I had a drink or two? No. Would you be wounded if I never sent you flowers? Never. Why can't a woman be like you? <laughs> one man in a million may shout a bit. Now and then there's one with slight defense. One perhaps whose truthfulness you doubt a bit. But by and large, we are the marvelous sex. Why can't a woman behave like a man? If men are so friendly, good natured and kind, the better companion you never will find. If I were hours late for dinner, would you bellow? Of course not. If I forgot your silly birthday, would you fast answers? Would you complain if I took out another fellow? <laughs> <laughs> Why can't a woman be like us? Hello. Hello, is Bruce the Badge in there? Who's he? <laughs> You'll never, never, never guess who this is. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, what a George of the memory you've got. How are you, old fellow? It's so good to hear your voice again. Thirty years, is it really? <laughs> yes, oceans of water. Uh, uh, who's your chap? Something rather unpleasant has happened here. Could I come over and see you? Oh, good. I'll come at once. Thank you, Boozy. I'm going over to the Home Office, Mrs. Pierce. I do hope you find her, Colonel Pickering. Mr. Higgins. We'll miss her. Mr. Higgins will miss her. Blast Mr. Higgins. I'll miss her. Pickering! 
Pickering, where's the colonel? He's gone to the home office, sir. Ah, you see, Mrs. Pitt, I'm disturbed, and he runs to help. There's a good fella. Mrs. Pitt, you're a woman. Why can't a woman be more like a man? If I were a woman, who made a war, he hails a princess by one and by all. Would I start weeping like a bathtub overflowing? and carry on as if my home were in a tree. Would I run off and never tell me where I'm going? <laughs> Why can't a woman be like me? Whether I treat you rudely, 
but whether you ever heard me treat anyone else better. <laughs> I don't care how you treat me. I don't mind you swearing at me. I don't mind a black eye. I've had one before this. But I won't be passed over. Then get out of my way. I won't stop for you. You talk about me as if I were a motor bus. So you are a motor bus. All bounce and go and no consideration for anyone. But I can get along without you. Don't think I can't. I know you can. I told you you could. <clears throat> you never wondered, I suppose, whether I can get along without you. Don't you try to get around me. You'll have to do without me. And so I shall. Without you or any soul on earth. But I shall miss you, Eliza. I've learned something from your idiotic notions. I confess that humbly and gratefully. Well, you have my voice on your gramophone when you're lonely without me. You can turn it on. It's got no feelings to hurt. I can't turn your soul on. No. Oh, you are a devil. You can twist the heart in a girl as easily as some can twist her arms to hurt her. What am I to come back for? For the fun of it. That's why I took you on. But you mean throw me out tomorrow if I don't do it? Me too. Yes, and you may walk out tomorrow if I don't know everything you want me to. And live with father? Yes, or sell flowers. If only I could. Would you rather marry Pickering? I would marry you if you asked me, and you're nearer my age than what he is. Than he is. I'll talk as I like. <laughs> you're not my teacher now. That's not what I want. And don't you stink it. I've always had chaps enough wanting me that way. Freddie Hill writes to me twice and three times a day, sheets and sheets. Oh, in short, you want me to be as infatuated about you as he is, is that it? No, I don't. <coughs> That's not the sort of feeling I want from you. I want a little kindness. I know. I am a common, ignorant girl, and you are a book-learned gentleman, but I'm not dirt under your feet. What I done? What I did was not for the dresses and the taxis. I did it because we were pleasant together, and I got came to care for you, not to want you to make love to me, and not forgetting the difference between us, but more friendly. Yes, of course. That's just how I feel. Mm. And, and how Pickering feels. Eliza, you're a fool. That's not a proper answer to give me. It's all you'll get until you stop being a common idiot. But if you're going to be a lady, you'll have to give up feeling neglected if the men you know don't spend half their time sniveling over you, and the other half giving you black eyes. But you find me cold, unfeeling, selfish, don't you? Very well, be off with you to the sort of people you like. Marry some sentimental hog or other with lots of money and a thick pair of lips to kiss you with and a thick pair of boots to kick you in. If you can't appreciate what you've got, you'd better get what you can appreciate. I can't talk to you. You turn everything against me. I'm always in the wrong. But don't you be too sure you have me under your feet to be trampled on and talk down. I marry Freddy, I will, just as soon as I'm able to support him. <laughs> that poor devil who couldn't get a job as an errand boy, even if he had the guts to try for it. Woman, do you not understand? I have made you a consort for a king. Freddy loves me. That makes him king enough for me. I don't want him to work. He wasn't brought up to a desire. I'll go and be a teacher. What are you teaching him today? What you taught me. I'll teach phonetics. <laughs> That brilliant Hungarian. What? <laughs> that imposter, that humbug, that toady ignoramus, teaching my methods, my discoveries. You take one step in that direction, and I'll bring your neck to here. Bring away? What do I care? I always knew you'd strike me one day. Oh. That's done you in really easy times. No, I don't care that. For your bullying and your big talk. What a fool. What a dominating fool. To think you were the earth and sky.
your mouth that I didn't put there. She'll regret it! 
It's doomed before they even take the vow. I can see her now, Mrs. Freddy Einstein Hill, in a wretched little flat above a store. I can see her now, not a penny in the till, and a bill collector beating at the door. She'll try to keep the things I told her, and end up selling flowers instead. <laughs> begging for her bread and water, while her husband has his breakfast in bed. In a year or so, when she's prematurely grey and the blossom in her cheek has turned to chalk, she'll come home and lo, he'll have upped and run away with a social climbing heiress from New York. Poor Eliza! How simply frightful! How humiliating! How delightful! <laughs> How poignant it will be on that inevitable night when she hammers on my door in tears and rags. Miserable and lonely, repentant and contrite. Will I let her in or her to the wolves? Show her kindness or the treatment she deserves? Will I take her back or throw the baggage out? I'm a most forgiving man. <laughs> so never could, never would take a position and staunchly never bite. Just a most forgiving man. But I will never take her back. If she were crawling on her knees, let her shiver, let her moan, let her promise to atone. I will slam the door and let the hell down freeze. I'm ready to pay you. Not asking any favour, any treats, music, if I was dirt. 
Where the devil am I slippers? <laughs> 